Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the comments on the videos posted on YouTube and on Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments, they come through social media such as Mastodon, sometimes through Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is actually, I get these kinds of questions and comments a lot. People are uh, thankful for the content I make. And I typically don't read these kinds of comments, even though I love getting them. But this was a lengthy one, and I think it sums up uh, a lot of the comments that I get from many of you guys that are appreciative of the work I do. So I did want to read this one here today. Hey, DT, I don't feel like this is shared enough, but I wanted to personally thank you so much for being such an awesome content creator. You've inspired and converted many people to Linux. I really believe that you bring a level of openness and truth in the video creation space that I've never seen before. And I watch a lot of content online. I've switched to full-time Linux and have so much more understanding about the freedoms of software and IT in general thanks to your videos going over the reasons why free and open source software is so important. I don't think I would have ever switched to Linux if it wasn't told flat out by you why other operating systems don't share the same uniqueness as our friendly Penguin has. I just wanted to reiterate that I really appreciate what you're doing and I hope that you continue sharing the gospel of Linux to everyone who will hear it. Take care my friend heart. Well, I really appreciate these kinds of comments, and I am uh, so glad that this particular individual found Linux, and I'm, I'm really glad that they've learned something from the channel. He mentions he's learned a lot about Linux and IT in general, and that's fantastic. And when I say I, I get these kinds of comments a lot, when I was scouring the internet for various Hey DT questions, because this has become a regular part of my channel here in the last couple of years, is doing these Hey DT episodes, and I'm looking for all the questions and comments that begin with hey DT on YouTube and Mastodon and Reddit and things like that. And I had probably a dozen similar kinds of comments from people that uh, are new to Linux that just found out about Linux. In many cases, I was their introduction into Linux. And that's kind of why I do what I do is uh, obviously to wean people off from proprietary software and get them over to free and open source software. And also just to be an educational resource, right? That's why I don't I, I don't lock any of my content behind paywalls. Let's start with that. And that's why I don't do things like, uh, you know, Udemy courses. And, you know, I, I, I never do any of my edu educational content that should be free for everyone, including children. You know, I never ask for payment for that, right? You guys that, that find my, my stuff useful, I ask for donations. I ask for your support on Patreon. And I hope those of you that have the means can support me on Patreon. But, you know, I, I want my information, all of my videos to be out there freely available to everyone. It's also why I license everything under a Creative Commons license. All my videos are Creative Commons. Uh, a lot of the stuff I do, you know, scripting and any kind of programs I write, most of the stuff on my GitLab, you know, if I remember to add a license to it, it's all licensed under free licenses, right? I, I put it all out there for the world. And I do that mainly just to practice what I preach mainly, but I am very thankful that uh, I've played some small part and hopefully making a difference, a small difference in some people's lives. Now enough of the comments that are heaping praise on me, even though I love them. Let's move on to the questions that have some real meat and potatoes. The next question, hey DT, I finally switched to an Arch-based distro and need a particular program not in the repos. I guess this means I have to compile. Can you make a video on compiling software? Um, well, let's take this in two parts. First of all, you're on an Arch-based distro and you need a program that's not in the repos. Now, Arch has a very wide selection of software. It's kind of hard to find a piece of software that's actually not packaged for Arch Linux, especially when you involve the AUR. So if you're new to Arch, which you obviously are, you say you just switched probably, you know, from something like an Ubuntu base or a Debian base, probably most new users start with that. And you just switched to Arch for the first time or an Arch based distro. You know, some of those distros and certainly mainline Arch, they don't have the AUR enabled 
out of the box. So enable the AUR. It's a user repository. It's a community repository of packages. And chances are the program you're looking for will probably be in the AUR. If you're using a new user friendly uh, Arch based distro like Endeavor or Garuda or Manjaro or Arco, then they have the AUR typically already enabled. They may even have a graphical package manager or something like PAMAC already installed. And hopefully the AUR is enabled for that and you can just search AUR packages in your graphical software center. So try that stuff out first before you decide to go try to compile something because you don't want to have to compile a program unless it's really necessary. Now, can I make a video on compiling software? The problem is every program is different as far as the steps for compilation. Now, it depends on the programming language it was written in. It just, it just depends on a lot of things. I mean, you know, even programs written in the same programming language have different compilation instructions sometimes. So typically many programs, not not most and certainly not all, but many programs, how you compile software is you enter three commands at the command line. You do a dot slash configure, then you do a make, and then you do sudo make install. That's for a lot of programs, especially C programs. But again, it will differ depending on the programs. And that's why I'm not going to make a uh, compilation kind of video because I, I would have to cover so many different scenarios. It would be impossible. Now, some programs are may, may not be available in the Arch repositories, and they may not be available in the AUR, the Arch user repository. But have you tried looking for this particular program as a snap package, as a flat pack, as an app image? What programming language is it written in? Because many programming languages have specific programming language package managers built around them. For example, Python has pip, and a Ruby has gem, and Rust has cargo, and Haskell has cabal, and yada, yada, yada. You've got all of these programming language specific package managers that sometimes these programs can be found in if they're not in your Linux distributions repositories. So. I wouldn't jump to compiling software just yet. I, I would check some of this other stuff out because it's probably there uh, because, again, I, I think this person is a little new to Linux, so maybe they haven't explored some of these other avenues just yet. Moving on to the next question. Hey, DT, can you find a full desktop environment that is as lightweight as a window manager? No. <laughs> and I say no in general. It's because what is a full desktop environment? A full desktop environment is a window manager with some other stuff added, right? So can a window manager with other stuff added, the full desktop environment, can it be as lightweight as just the window manager? Common sense says no, right? So now can you find certain full desktop environments that are lightweight, or more lightweight than certain window managers. Yeah, there's some window managers that are a little heavier than others. And then if your desktop environment is really stripped down, maybe you know, you're know you just using a few base components as part of your desktop environment, it might be lighter weight than a certain window manager. But generally speaking, no, a full desktop environment is not going to be more lightweight than just a window manager. But nobody really uses just a window manager. When I and other people talk about I'm a window manager user, they're meaning I installed a standalone window manager and then I built a full desktop environment around it because you're still going to install other programs. You're still going to install a panel or a dock. You're going to install some kind of sys tray, menu system, run launchers and things like that that your traditional full desktop environments all have. It's just I go and pick the components myself. So when I say I'm a tiling window manager user, what I'm really saying is I started with a tiling window manager and I built a full desktop environment around. It. And the next question is a lengthy one, but bear with me. I think this is an important one. Hey, DT, I've been a Windows user all of my life, and I've used Linux in the past and really enjoyed the idea of free and open source operating systems. But I'm still afraid of making the switch because there are so many good distros out there, and all of them have good and bad stuff in them. The only distro that I would like 99% would be Linux Mint XFCE. But the desktop environment doesn't receive as much love by the developers as the other desktop environments. What would you recommend? Okay, so what I would recommend, if you really like Linux Mint XFCE, I would use Linux Mint XFCE. I would just install that and go with it. Um, if you want to hop to something else later, that's fine, but don't don't move to something without really 
living in Linux Mint XFCE for a little while and seeing if it actually works. It's, it's like you want to pronounce judgment on it before not even really trying it. And you're worried it doesn't get as much love as the other desktop environments for Linux Mint. So Linux Mint has three main editions, right? They have the Cinnamon edition and the Linux Mint team helps develop the Cinnamon desktop environment, right? So that's why it gets a lot of love, right? The Cinnamon desktop environment is their baby. And then you have Linux Mint Mate, which the Linux Mint devs spend a lot of time helping develop the Mate desktop environment as well. That's why it gets a lot of love. And then XFCE is just another desktop environment that they have an addition for. But it is one of the three main additions, meaning it is supported. If you ask support questions, they should support you. So it is actually a real Linux Mint distribution as much as the Cinnamon desktop, as much as the Mate desktop. So I would just use Linux Mint XFCE. I, I, there's really no reason not to. So if you're concerned that for some reason it's, you're going to install it and just be left on your own and not get any support, that's not going to happen. Now, you mentioned that, you know, every distribution has good stuff and bad stuff to them. Yeah, I, I've never loved everything about any Linux distribution I've tried. And I've tried dozens of them on physical hardware. I'm talking about the distributions I've actually lived in for a little while. I've tried, I don't know, probably two, three dozen different distributions on my physical equipment. And I loved most of them. And I've also hated most of them. And sometimes I've both hated and loved the same distribution. So it's one of those things I tell people this all the time, especially new to Linux users. You're not going to stay on one distribution. That's That rarely happens. Install whatever it is you're interested in right now. And if your interests change, if you decide, hey, this really isn't working for me, you can move to something else down the road. It's not a big deal. That's kind of what we do in the Linux space. So it's not one of those things where you sign up for a team and you're stuck on it, right? You can switch teams anytime you want. Moving on to several questions I've gotten here in the last couple of weeks. I get these questions all the time. A lot of people are really interested in my phone. <laughs> I'll read this question here. Hey DT, why are you using an Android phone and not a Linux phone? And similarly, I've got some other uh, comments very similar. Hey DT, what sort of phone do you use? Are, are you using Ubuntu Touch? Are you using a proprietary cell phone? Are you using one of the free Linux phones? You got a Pine phone, yada, yada, yada. Hey DT, what's your phone situation and why are you using proprietary Android phone? Okay, well, I do have an Android phone. I have a Samsung Galaxy 10 that I've had for about three years now. And here's the deal with the phones. I'm not really interested in phones. So why have I not explored some of the free and open source operating systems, mobile operating systems for a phone? Why, why don't I buy these devices? To be honest, I don't like phones. And I mean all phones. I don't like that particular device. I think phones are generally not healthy. The people that play on phones all the time, they're constantly checking social media and things like that. I'm not one of those people. I have a phone. I'm one of these people that I didn't have a phone for years, way past when everybody else had a phone, a cell phone. I refused to have one for ideological reasons. I refused to have a phone. And I finally got one because, you know, a few years back, I was in a situation, a supervisory role at work where I had to be on call 24-7 and I had to have a cell phone on me. That's the only reason I have that particular Android device that I have, that Android phone, is because I had to have a phone. And I don't really care if the proprietary operating system on it, Android, you know, I, I don't care if it's proprietary or if I had free and open source operating system. I'm not really using the operating system on that phone for anything. That is not a computer to me. That was just a phone so I could receive phone calls, right? That's all I do on that phone is make phone calls, receive phone calls. And it really, that doesn't really matter if it's a free operating system or proprietary operating system, because you're still not free. Yeah. You know, you're still not private because of the phone network itself, right? The carrier, right? I, I not, you can't make that free, right? It's not, that's always going to be a proprietary system, but the other stuff on that phone, like I'm not doing online banking and stuff like that. I'm not, you look, I, I don't have a Facebook account, but I'm not doing any of the stuff that most people are doing on their phones. It's just a device for an emergency situation to occasionally receive phone calls and occasionally make phone calls. Although I can tell you, sometimes I can go a week or two without ever dialing a number on my phone. Like I, when I say I don't really do phones, I'm serious. I don't like phones. And now that I no longer have a job uh, or I, you know, do this for a living, you know, I work for myself making video content on YouTube and Odyssey. 
I don't. I no longer need to be on call 24-7. I don't actually need that phone. That phone is paid for, that Samsung Galaxy 10, and it's three years old, meaning, you know, I've already paid for the contract. I could go get an upgrade. You know, I could go get a cheap upgrade to the next version of the uh, Galaxy phones, but I'm not going to. I don't think I'm ever going to go get another phone. I'm really, I think I'm done with them at this point. So uh, I've got that phone. It's already paid for and I'll keep it as long as it's working fine. But when it stops working, if it, I break it or it just dies on its own, I don't think I'm going to replace that phone. The next question is, I've gotten a lot of these here lately and it reads something like, Hey DT, is this your channel as well? And then it's a link to a, a YouTube video and the YouTube video is one of my videos the YouTube channel is not my channel okay so all of my videos are licensed under a Creative Commons license meaning anybody's free to use them you know to do whatever the hell they want I don't care but here's the thing with a Creative Commons license you're free to do whatever you want with my content I put it out there for anybody to use but you have to attribute me right there has to be an attribution to me meaning hey this is where I got this guy's video Here's a link to his YouTube channel or his website or, you know, whatever. You have to link to me in some way. You have to give me credit for being the author of that video. If you just take my video and throw it up on your YouTube channel, yes, that is a violation of the license. And if I reported this individual to YouTube, their channel would probably get a strike. They'd have to take that video down. And it, the way YouTube works is when you... Uh, report somebody for stealing your content you can either tell youtube to immediately take the video down no notice or anything just take it down or i can give them a seven day notice saying hey here's the problem correct the problem or within seven days youtube will take the video down now this particular link this video no longer exists i actually uh, read this this morning that link the video is already removed and whatever channel this was they've already deleted the whole channel I didn't report the guy, but if he was stealing my content, not attributing anything to me, he was probably doing that to a whole bunch of other channels as well. And this is dangerous. This You don't do this, right? You never take video, especially entire videos from other people and post them unless you attribute that, that person. And even if you attribute that person, in my case, it would have been okay if all he had to do was just attribute me. He could use my entire video, but most people don't have their videos licensed under a free license like the Creative Commons license, right? It's a proprietary YouTube license, meaning hey, you can't use this guy's video at all unless it falls under fair use. And that can be interpreted in wildly different ways. So generally speaking, it's kind of dangerous to use other people's video. And I will tell you as a content creator, absolutely never use audio that you don't own because the YouTube algorithms are really good with audio music, especially, right? So anytime you play music that you don't actually own on a video, it will almost always get, get flagged. And usually that video will get flagged before it ever goes live on the internet, just by uploading it. YouTube's algorithms will already know, Hey, you don't own this. You're getting striked for it. And the next question is, hey DT, hi from England. I love my English viewers, by the way. Uh, your content is great. Have you written any books on Linux? And people have asked this a few times is, do I have any books that are published that you guys can go read? I don't. I, I, I've had some things in the works for a few years, various book projects that are not Linux related. I, I really don't want to discuss that because again, it's not really related to anything on this channel, but I have thought about possibly at some point publishing a book or multiple books on Linux related topics, because honestly, after doing what I've done here for the last five years or so on YouTube and uh, doing so much with various Linux related topics, you know, nearly 1200 videos at this point, you know, I have a lot of knowledge of, of course, I mean, I could do educational tutorial kind of books as well, but also, you know, I have a lot of, you know, funny stories, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I could do a lot with a Linux book. I, you know, I could actually, I could probably make a pretty entertaining and maybe even funny at some point kind of Linux related book. Um, you guys, if you're interested in maybe a, a book by me, uh, if, if you have some ideas on topics you think are appropriate for somebody like me to cover in book form, let me know down below in the comments.
And the last question is, hey DT, you said that if you created a desktop environment, you'd use Haskell. Are you still working with GTK and Haskell? Are you planning to create a desktop environment? So I'm not planning to create my own desktop environment. Let's get that out of the way. I have said in the past a few times, just offhand, right in passing, I've said, if I created my own desktop environment, I'd use Haskell. And the reason I said that is for two reasons. One, Haskell is the language I'm most comfortable in. You know, I, I know a little Haskell and I know enough Haskell that it doesn't scare me. Right. So I, I'm OK with Haskell. The other reason I mentioned I do it with Haskell is in the last couple of months, you guys probably remember the video I made about two months ago where I created my very first GTK application, a graphical GTK application using Haskell. So I've already explored a little bit on how to create GTK applications using Haskell. So if I created my own desktop environment, it would make sense to use GTK and Haskell, right? Because I, that, that I've already explored that avenue a little bit. I To go any other route, I would have to learn some stuff that I don't already know, right? So for me, the easiest path would be GTK and Haskell. But again, I'm not planning on creating my own desktop environment. But what I am planning on doing is continuing working with both GTK and Haskell. And I may actually do some video content on this, maybe in the near future. If you guys would like to see more videos about GTK and Haskell, maybe a series of videos where we start from the ground up and we build, we develop a GTK app using Haskell. Or maybe you guys want specifically Haskell related content, like the programming language, not necessarily GTK content, but you guys want to learn more about how to use Haskell. I could do some of that, you know, some basic stuff with Haskell, uh, maybe show you guys how to work with like Stack and Cabal and things like that, and maybe some of the basics of the language so you understand it more. Um, maybe so, you know, when you configure things like Xmonad, for example, that you know exactly what's going on in that config. We could do more content like that in the future if you guys are interested. I'm not sure how many of you guys would really be interested because that's, that starts getting kind of deep. That Those are nerdy topics. GTK, Haskell, really nerdy topics. But if you guys are really interested in it, I'll be honest. It interests me, right? Like I would enjoy making those videos. If you guys want it, again, let me know down in the comments below. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. I need to thank Devin, Gabe, James, Maxim, Matt, Michael, Mitchell, Paul, Scott, Wes, Alan, Armor Dragon, Chuck, Commander, Angry, Dai, Yokai, Dylan, George, Lee, Linux, Ninja, Mike, Erjan, Alexander, Peace Arch, Mador, Polytech, Reality, Let's Red Prophet, Steven, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode you just watched would not have been possible. Shows also brought to you by each and every one of these fine ladies and gentlemen. All these names you're seeing on the screen, these are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm just sponsored by you guys, the community. I'm a little out of frame. I'm going to move over. If you guys want to see more videos, more Hey DT episodes, more videos about Linux, subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace. I still haven't completed DTOS and they want me to do DTDE.